Let's put our hands together for our young people heading out. We love you guys. And our youth leaders who do a brilliant job. Have a fantastic morning. They're meeting over in the shed now. Uh, converted the upstairs, what was the Creative Arts Academy dance studio into a meeting space for youth, which is pretty cool. So parents, if you haven't been up there and you've got youth in the program, go have a look at what they've done. It looks really cool. Um, like Pastor Dave said, we have such an amazing opportunity this Easter. <clears throat> and you would see, have seen these beautiful postcards. Uh, they're actually invites for all of us to take, not to just stick on our fridge, <laughs> but to pray over, pray over, <laughs> and then to say, Lord, who can I invite to come along? Who can I bring? Who can I pray for that you'll move upon their hearts to come? I came to know Jesus because someone invited me to Easter. Who is waiting for an invitation from us? <laughs> Something to think about. We've got some time. Pray for people in our life groups. Wouldn't that be good if we start a prayer list for people that we're wanting to see come to Easter? Our neighbours, uh, our service station, petrol filler upper people who we pay for, <laughs> you know, school friends, work friends. Who is it that God wants to put on your heart to pray for to come for this Easter? The beautiful picture on the front of this, the grave empty, the tomb, with that, just that little glimpse of what's going on inside is actually, was actually done by Vanessa Bartholomew. She painted it. Isn't it beautiful? So gorgeous. And then on the back, she painted those little thumbnail pictures. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa, using your creative gift for us. Yeah. But we're starting a new series for Easter called Amazing Grace. And we just really felt as a team to actually think about how grace is something that is so much bigger and more wonderful than you can imagine. <laughs> it's so much better than you can think. And so we want to tell the story actually have a dramatic retelling of the Easter story through the eyes of some of the characters at Easter on Good Friday. We're going to have a full kids program on Good Friday this year instead of Easter Sunday. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to have a preschool program. But both are connected to tell the story, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, of how people's lives were dramatically changed when they encountered God's amazing grace far greater, far bigger than you can imagine, far better than what you think. Peter wasn't looking for it. Mary <laughs> felt ashamed like she didn't deserve it. The thief on the cross didn't do anything to earn it, you know? And that's the story of our lives as well. So be prayerfully thinking about who you can invite. That'd be awesome. And I've seen some of the stuff that Creative Ministries are putting together. It is stunning, absolutely stunning. So far throughout this 40 days of prayer campaign, we've heard about the what of prayer, what prayer actually is. We've heard about prayer is about having a relationship with God and communicating and talking with Him about every aspect of our lives. Because you and I were made for God. You were made to relate to Him and communicate to Him. We've also heard about the why of prayer. Why should we pray? Pastor Bill talked about because God is good and we sang about his goodness this morning. He's always good all the time, even when we can't wrap our heads around why he said no to a certain prayer or not yet or why we will only one day see it fulfilled when we get to heaven. But he's always good. <laughs> and then we heard last week about how God wants to relate to us and is and wants us to relate back to him when we know Christ as our heavenly father, our Abba our daddy, that sometimes our picture of God is skewed and that we need a new picture to actually know that that's who he is. That's what the Bible says. That's how he asks us to call him. Jesus said, when you pray, our father, he wants us to call him that. So last week, for those of you who are here, I encouraged all of us to start using, when we pray, to start every prayer using father, daddy, Abba, <laughs> dad, how did you go with that this week? Did it make a difference? I heard some amazing stories of people who, the first time ever they've called God Father. And it's starting to revolutionise their sense of closeness with Him, the way they see Him, sense of re recognising His presence in their life. Keep doing that. Let's keep doing that. Calling God by how He asks us to call Him Father. <laughs> 
there's a quote that Rick, Rick Warren uh, praise. And before we sh sh share that, I'm actually going to show you some other fantastic whys of prayer. So let's have a look at the screens. Prayer keeps you connected to God like a branch on a vine. God never gets tired of hearing or answering your prayers. Prayer is the pathway to peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. <laughs> and as we draw near to him in prayer, he promises that he will draw near to us. Prayer is God's chosen method of meeting your needs. Prayer makes the impossible possible. I've been hearing back some fantastic answers to prayer. Share them with people. Tell your God stories of what he's doing. The ultimate purpose for the answer to your prayer is that God will be glorified. And so right at the halfway mark of 40 days of prayer, I was struck by this quote that Rick Warren says when he says, prayer is our greatest privilege. Prayer is our greatest privilege. Does prayer feel like your greatest privilege? Or does it feel like your greatest chore? Or does it feel like your greatest bore? <laughs> Let's be honest. Does it feel, is prayer your greatest privilege? Maybe sometimes, maybe not. Well, I just want to pause for a moment because I want to speak to anyone in the room who's been facing clinical depression or who has had just this desperate desire to pray but you feel like you can't. Maybe you feel numb, maybe you feel desperate, maybe you feel overwhelmingly sad or guilty and those feelings are not going away. One of the best things you can do if you feel like that is to reach out and talk to someone that you trust. Because you need the prayers of other people <laughs> who can rally around you and pray for you. <laughs> and you don't have to strive more or try and work God out more. But maybe just by being honest and telling someone, you can actually have people stand with you so that you know that you're not alone. And maybe, just maybe, you might even need to seek out some medical advice, some support. So when I'm talking about being finding prayer a chore or a bore, I'm not talking about someone who is feeling overwhelmingly depressed. Because... When you feel depressed, it affects everything else. And so prayer is going to feel like a chore. It is going to feel like a bore. So I just want to put that disclaimer there for you. There's grace for you. There's, there's, there's uh, care for you. And if you feel comfortable, I'd love you to come and share with me or anyone else. If that's your experience and you haven't told anyone, you're not alone. But if that's not your experience right now and prayer still feels like a chore or a bore, <laughs> we each need to know what Jesus, the living word, says about how to pray. Because I actually am here to tell you this morning that Jesus has been praying for you this week. He's been praying for you. The Bible says that Jesus intercedes, he's interceding for us. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's been praying for you. That's amazing. He's been praying for you. <laughs> he's been talking to his Father. He's been working in your life to bring you here this morning because you need to hear this message. He's got some life-giving encouragement that's just for you. Just for me. And this is what I felt. I felt that your Heavenly Father wants you to know some of you, He knows that some of you dread praying. Some of you actually dread praying. Some of you feel completely inadequate when it comes to prayer. You don't feel like you get the words right. You don't know how to put into words what's really going on in your heart. 
you feel weird praying out loud and you especially feel nervous praying in front of other people. Mostly you feel you're not doing it right. I believe there's some people here today who have become bored with praying to God. Maybe you use the same words the same way or you're praying the same thing for so long, you're boring yourself. It's easy to say grace before a meal because that's what we do, not because we're actually grateful to God for being our provider and for having food in a world where so many people go without food. We can just go through the motions. Thank you, Lord, for this food in Jesus' name. Amen. And we can pray like that too. For some people here today, there's no passion when you pray anymore. It's all words but no heart. And if you don't feel like praying, maybe talk to God about the fact that you don't feel like praying. Start there. Be honest. Some of you have decided that I feel that prayer just doesn't work for you. (laughs) It works for Nathan and Alyssa when they're up here leading worship. It works for Pastor Bill. It works for your grandmother, but it doesn't work for you. You've tried. You don't feel anything. You don't sense anything. You feel like you're just going through the motions because you should. So what's the point? You always find yourself hoping for something more, but have stopped expecting anything to happen when you pray. For you, prayer feels a lot like awkward silence with the crickets. I know it's gone quiet in this room, so maybe this is hitting home for some people. I just really felt that God wants you to know your heaven. He knows. He actually knows. <laughs> You don't have to stress about it. Your Heavenly Father knows. And that's why he's brought you here today to hear this message because we've talked about the what, we've talked about the, the why, but some of you need to hear the how. You need a new how because your how's not working. <laughs> and Jesus taught us how to pray. And we're going to talk about that today. But for some of you, it's going to be life-giving to actually open up this, this whole new aspect of communicating with God that's not boring, <laughs> that's not just going through the motions, and it's not just repeating things and saying the right words, but it's heart-to-heart communication with your Father. And I also want to speak to people here, if you don't know God as your Father, if you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life. He loves you so much. He made you. He saw you as you were being formed in your mother's womb. He saw you as you were being knitted together in that secret place. He put you together and put you on this earth for a purpose. And the main purpose is so that you could know him, have relationship with him. Talk with him. Live out his purposes for your life. He has a great plan for your life. And so you're not here by accident. You have a heavenly father who loves you. And he loves you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on a horrible cross. Why did he do it when he wasn't guilty? Why would he allow soldiers to beat him and whip him and mock him and put a crown of thorns on his head? Why would he go through all of that when he could have called down angels and got himself off the cross and just wiped everyone out? Why would he do that? Because he knew that there was no way for you to come to know God. There was no way for you to have a relationship with your heavenly Father without the problem of your sin, your independence from God being completely dealt with. Because God is holy and he cannot have relationship with people who are unholy unless he covers over and forgives and wipes away our sin. And sin is actually just stuff you, God, I'll run life my own way. That's what sin is. It's an attitude of just saying, no thanks, I'm living for myself. And all the things that flow out of that. Well, Jesus came because he knew you couldn't fix it yourself. He knew you couldn't put yourself back together and pull your socks off and do enough and make yourself good enough for God. He came to die on a cruel cross for your sin, for your independence from him. And he suffered and he took it on. He took on the weight of our sin. 
And he chose not to get off that cross and he did it even though he was innocent because he loves you. And he was buried in a grave. Everyone thought that's the end, it's over, but it wasn't over. Jesus had the final word because he rose again from the dead. He's actually alive. And we come here and we worship him at the Christian Family Center. We talk about him because there's some of us here today who have a real vital living relationship with the risen Christ. He lives in us and he works through us. Because he's alive. We know him. We talk with him. We can't see him with our eyes, but he's alive. He rose from the dead and he ascended to the Father after he'd appeared to all these different people. And he sits at the right hand of the Father praying for you. (laughs) And what's he praying? He's saying, come home to me. Come home to my Father. This is what you were made for. I've done everything necessary to make a way for you to know God. I've removed the barrier of sin. I've taken it on myself. And in fact, more than that, I give you God's perfect record, my perfect record, my report card before God. I give you that. (laughs) And so when anyone comes to Christ, they become a new creation. Why? Because the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. He doesn't come to live in people who are not made holy. We're made holy by the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus. And so if you don't know him today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I've been talking about him. It's just introducing you to who he is. But now is an opportunity for you to invite him into your life right now. To ask him, to say, God, I want to know you. I don't even understand all of this, but that sounds amazing. If you love me enough to die for everything that I've ever done wrong, to make a way for me to know God, I want to know you. And it was 20 years ago this April that I gave my life over to Jesus. And you should see what he's done in my life. You should see how he's been faithful to me. You should see how he's kept me and helped me. You should see how he's changed me. And he can do the same for you. Why don't we just take a moment now right across our church. We're going to pray. We're going to pray a prayer out loud. Christian Family Centre folks who know Jesus, we're going to pray and support anyone (laughs) who might be wanting to pray this out loud. We're all going to pray this out loud. Cool? All right. Let's close our eyes. Right now, if that's you, And you're wanting to receive Jesus today. You're wanting to receive him. Just slip up your hand. I'm not going to invite you down the front. I'm not going to embarrass you. You can just slip up your hand and say, yes, that's me. I want to pray that prayer. I want to receive him today. I see your hand. Is there anyone else? I see your hand. You can put your hand down once you've lifted it up. Is there anyone else? All right. If you'd, even if you didn't put up your hand, you can pray this prayer. But if you mean it with all your heart, God will hear it and understand. Let's pray all together, church. Dear Jesus, I thank you for your love and for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving all my sin. I receive your forgiveness. Come and live in me, Jesus. I want to follow you. Thank you that I'm now a Christian. Not because of what I've done. Because Jesus has done everything to help me know God. Amen. Mate, if you pray that prayer, there's a mass. I'm just so, I want to run over and give you a big hug. I won't. (laughs) But I'm just, it's the most awesome thing that you can do with your life, to give it into God's hands. And there's a massive party in heaven happening for you right now that God's leading the charge because he's a fun God. He's the funnest person in the universe. And he's got massive 
I don't know if he's got massive balloons, but let's just go with that. <laughs> I can just, he's just saying, come on, angels, and he's, they're chanting your name because you today have come home to know Jesus. And so I just like those CFC pastors that I like, ask to just come out the front quickly to just slip out of your seats and their spouses if they're available. Great, thank you. So Pastor Jill Steele is here. Alan couldn't be here today, but she's a champion. Um, David and Judy, Ian and Lynn. I just wanted you to put a name to a face of someone that you could tell what you decided today. If that's the first time you've ever prayed that prayer, these are champion people. There's so many others I could have asked to come out the front. But there's just some people that you can put a name to a face. And what I'd love you to do is at the end of the service, when we give opportunity for ministry to come forward, because we would love to pray. These, these guys would love to pray for you and actually help you know what's next. And just... Say, good on you. (laughs) So what we're going to do now, for those people who did pray that and mean it sincerely, we're going to pray for you as a church family. So let's pray one more time. Father, I thank you for those people who responded to you today. I thank you that they're now our brothers and our sisters in Christ and that you love them. And I just pray that you would help them now take their next steps in following you, that you'd guard their minds, that you'd protect them and help them in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we put our hands together for Jesus? He's awesome. Mate, we can all go home. That's awesome. (laughs) But I do want to touch on some other things about prayer because I started with that because that's the foundation. We don't pray to get God's favour. We don't pray to try and make ourselves right with God. All prayer flows out of the fact that God initiated a relationship with us. And it flows out of who he is. So it's important to remember that. But what I want to talk about today is how to pray throughout your day. The how of prayer. Because it's easy to get caught up in the the what and the why. And that's really important to lay that foundation. But let's talk about the how. In Ephesians 6.18 it says, Pray on every occasion as the Spirit leads. This is the um, today English version talks about every occasion on every occasion you can talk to God anywhere about anything all the time (laughs) as the spirit leads when you get an impression when you get an idea when somebody just pops into your head that you haven't been thinking about pray for them send them a text say I just prayed for you I had people do that to me randomly every now and again and it's so encouraging Matt Richardson sent me a text Oh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, just a word, a scripture and said, just praying for you, want you to know you're a champion. It was awesome. God might put someone on your head and as you start to pray for them, he might speak to you about a situation or encouragement for them. You don't know how much of an impact they can have in someone's life. And if, so that verse, the full verse in the uh, New uh, Century Version says, pray in the Spirit at all times with all kinds of prayers, asking for everything you need. To do this, you must always be ready and never give up. Always pray for all God's people. Always, all. Keep on praying. Never cease. Don't stop. How do we actually pray <laughs> without ceasing? How do we actually pray like that, because Paul always starts all of his letters with prayer. Halfway through when he's writing the Apostle Paul, his letters, he bursts into prayer. He's always up praying for you. I can't stop thinking about you. You're in my prayers. I pray with you without ceasing. How do we do that? <laughs> we need to have an ongoing conversation with God. An ongoing conversation with God. You think about breathing. When you breathe, you don't think about it. The more you hold a running conversation with God, And talk to him, oh, isn't that interesting? Look what they're doing on TV, God, that's weird. (laughs) Or, I love this show, God, this is awesome. You can talk to him about anything. The more you hold that, you can talk to him when you're talking to other people. Jesus, help me. (laughs) Help me now. (laughs) The more you have that ongoing running conversation with God, the more it will become a free-flowing conversation. The more it becomes natural, just like breathing. You don't have to think about it so much. But to start with, like anything, it takes practice. Oh, that's right. God, (laughs) I might think about him right now. I'm going to be in the zone with my head down thinking about my life, but God's the author of my life. Hello, God. And we can also have planned prayer times throughout our day. 
Having regular prayer times throughout your day can be a good thing. It can help prompt us and remind us and give us structure that helps us remember to focus on God. Do you know, for thousands of years, the Jews said prayers at set times. Daniel kneeled down and he prayed three times a day. As usual, he knelt to pray. (laughs) And this is amazing because in Roman cities, they have the forum, which is the the business, the place of political hub, the, the place where everything happens in the life of Roman cities. And so most Roman cities had a forum. And at the forum... The bell rang six times a day. 6 a.m. was called prime. That was the first hour. It meant beginning of business. This is when business starts. At 9 a.m. on the third hour, the bell rang again. At 12 p.m. at noon or the sixth hour, it was the lunch break. The bell rang again. At 3 p.m. or the ninth hour, the bell rang. It was back to work time. And then again at six, time to finish work, time to go home. The bell would ring. Soon Christians started using the bells for prayer times. The monks put bells in monasteries and in the 400s, monks thought, this is a bit ridiculous, I have to go outside six times a day to pull the bell. So they started to invent uh, contraptions or mechanisms to help them automatically ring this bell. And do you know the old Latin word for bell is clock? Clocks were actually invented to help us remember to pray. That's awesome. That's so awesome. (laughs) But we don't use clocks like that anymore, do we? Well, we can, but sometimes we forget. But planned prayer times that help us remember to focus on God can be so helpful. They don't make us more holy. All right? And that's where you can fall into religion when you have structured prayer time and you think, this is what makes me acceptable to God. If I remember to do this, if I make sure I fit these six things in, fit six prayer times into my day or whatever else it is. But if we know Christ, we're now holy and without fault in God's eyes. <laughs> when prayer is glorious and wonderful and also when we're struggling and we don't know what to pray or we think this is boring, God still loves us. We're still holy and without fault in his eyes. But there must have been something so powerful about how Jesus prayed that when his followers observed his relationship with God, his ongoing convo with the Father, (laughs) and when they saw his planned prayer times, because sometimes he went away and he prayed the whole night, When they saw his ongoing conversation and his planned prayer times, they knew it was the source of everything else that flowed from his life and ministry. I think Rick Warren said on our life group video this week, the disciples didn't ask Jesus, teach us how to heal people, teach us how to heal the sick. They asked him, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray like you pray, Jesus. And so in Matthew 6, we get Jesus' response. This then, he says, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And this appeared in later transcripts, so I've got it in brackets, but it's universally agreed this is in this passage. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, he said, you should pray like this. He didn't say you should pray this. You should pray like this. It's the how. It's not the what. You can pray about anything. But he's giving us the how. (laughs) And the Lord's Prayer is our model for life. Nowhere in the Bible are you or I commanded to recite the Lord's Prayer word for word. In fact, God says multiple times in the Scripture, don't say something over and over and over that just becomes a pointless, meaningless repetition. Jesus is not giving us a procedure to follow. He's not giving us a recipe or a magic incantation to say when we say the Lord's Prayer. 
This then is how you should pray. It's a model, it's a pattern. And since his own Saddleback Church, he took it through this 40 days of prayer campaign, they've produced resources for thousands of different churches to use. But since then, Rick Warren developed a really simple and effective way for people to apply the seven phrases in the Lord's Prayer to show us how to pray. And we're going to look at them now. How to pray throughout your day. Whether it's 30 seconds or a minute or five minutes, however much time you've put into it, whether you forget one and only do one and then you start keeping on practicing. I've been giving this a go this week. It's awesome. Number one, get up with gratitude. Who's a morning person? God bless you. you I think you find it easier to get up with gratitude. I'm <laughs> not a morning person. Get up with gratitude, not get up for coffee. <laughs> You can have coffee and gratitude at the same time, it's all right. When you get out of bed in the morning, or even before you get out of bed in the morning, before your breakfast or anything else, why not start with being grateful to God about something in your life? Tell Him the things you're grateful for. The first line of the Lord's Prayer is, Our Father in heaven. When you wake up, think about the things that God's given you, who He is the things that you might take for granted. Did you know that doctors have discovered the single healthiest emotion known to human beings is gratitude? The attitude of gratitude actually makes you healthier, mentally, emotionally, physically. It's actually good for your health. And gratitude helps us focus on our Father in heaven rather than our phone or This day is going to be awful. Wait till the kids wake up. (laughs) Michaela, I'm hearing you. (laughs) Um, In Matthew 6, verses 8 to 9, Jesus said, Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And then this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, What do you have that you were not given? Everything you have is a gift from God. And if it was given to you, how can you brag? And so if you check out your journal in page 178 to 181, there's, a, there's an A to Z list of gratitude. You can keep it by your bed. So that's what I've been doing. So when you wake up in the morning, you fill it in beforehand and then you wake up in the morning, you just read through the list. Read through one thing on the list and thank God. So I'll read you a couple of mine. A is for Abba Father. Thank you for being and choosing to be my daddy. Thank you for choosing me to know you as my Abba Father. And thank you for Angus. That's my son. B is belonging. Thank you that I belong to you and that you're a beautiful saviour, completely good, always kind, faithful to the end. Close. C, thank you, Father, that you're closer than my heartbeat and you're always with me. Thank you for Callan. That's my other son. So you can do that. Write out a gratitude list. Fill in a life journal. Stick it by your bed (laughs) while you're lying there first few minutes when you wake up rather than thinking, oh, I've got this and this and this to do. Lift up some gratitude to God. Try it this week. It'll frame your whole day. The second thing is, oh, and I just wanted to say, for each of these, I, mean, I just was thinking of a person that has taught me or I learn from when I hear them pray, I think, gratitude. This person is Jean Zumas. Whenever I hear her pray, thank you, Father. I just want to bless your name, God. Like, she's just amazing. Listen to people who pray prayers of gratitude because it'll do something for your faith and inspire you. Thank you, Jean. Bless God's name at breakfast. That's a good one to remember. I forgot the other day and I went, I'm just going to bless your name in the shower, God, because I forgot at breakfast time. But it's a prompt. It's a reminder to actually praise him. Praise him. There's so many things to praise God for. And this is the second phrase in the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name. What does it mean to bless? It means to honour, to respect, to give praise and adoration. We adore God. We bless him. We praise him. It doesn't have to take long. You just pause before you eat your wheat bix I bless you, God. 
you're a fun God. You're, a, you're the funnest person in the universe. I don't know. <laughs> you're my healer. Thank you, God. Bless his name at breakfast. Hallowed means holy. I'm going to respect your name. I'm going to honour your name. I'm going to praise your name. I'm going to adore your name. To remember my commitment to you, Lord, I'm going to bless your name at breakfast. You can do this with your kids. Let's bless God's name today. What do you love about God? What's so good about him? Let's bless him before we have breakfast. Psalm 145.2 says, Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Not just every Sunday. Not just every weekend. Every day. (laughs) What is the big deal about God's name? Well, God's name tells us who God is. There's like over a hundred different names for God in the Bible. He's not confused. They're actually titles. They're actually showing us part of the character of who he is. And when we focus on who he is, there's implications for what that means for our life. It encourages us. God says, I'm Abba. And we talked about that last week. It means I'm your loving father. He also says, I am El Dia, which means I am the God who knows you and I know everything. He also says, my name is Jehovah Rapha, which means I am the God who heals you. God says, my name is Jehovah Jireh, your provider. I am your provider. El Shaddai means I am the almighty God, which means I've all the power you need. You don't have to have all the power because I have all the power and I'm supporting you and I'm helping you. This is supposed to be inspiring your faith. You can say amen if it is. Good. Jehovah Shalom, I am your peace. There's Jehovah Sidkenu, I am your righteousness. You don't have to earn your way to heaven. I am your righteousness. And when we start to think on who God is, mate, We think, I don't have to worry about today. I don't have to be anxious because you are my peace. I bless you, Lord, for being my peace. You are my peace. Let your peace be all over me. Let it ooze out of me today. (laughs) Bless his name at breakfast. Psalm 910 says, those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. The more you know who God is and the more you know about how he reveals himself through his name, the more you relax, the more you're confident, the more you trust him. A person who I see this example in is my father-in-law, actually, Malen. You should hear this man say grace. It's not just thank you, Jesus, for the food. He is blessing God. It's beautiful, actually. It's not long. It's just heartfelt, sincere. I learn a lot from hearing Milan pray, blessing God for his family, for the good things that God's given him, for who God is. It's awesome. Psalm 9, verse 10. I've read that one. Good. Praise God. (laughs) Number three. At mid-morning... Remember what matters most at mid-morning. You know, sometimes we get halfway through our day and mid-morning and we're thinking, I've got no idea what I just did for the last hour and a half. I wasted all that time. (laughs) I can't remember what I did. I'm losing focus. (laughs) And so we go, I need a biscuit. I need a cup of tea. (laughs) Why you go and get that? Pray. Pray. That's the third phrase in um, the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I'm not focused this morning. I'm making something that is so so minor, major. But I want your will in my life. I want you to have your way in and through this situation. I want you to help me to focus so I can be productive. Would Would you let your kingdom come in and through me for the rest of today? It's just a pause. You can go sit in your car, take a toilet break. Doesn't set a set an alarm on your phone. If you're a teacher, you've got the recess bell. Brilliant. That might be your cue. (laughs) Something to just pause and remember what matters most, his kingdom. We're living for his kingdom. Matthew 6.10 says, May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And my experience doing this at mid-morning this past week, I felt more peaceful, more purposeful, more people-focused and so much more productive. Just pause. 
take a few seconds, take a minute. Look up from what you're doing and remember what matters most. Number four is list my needs at lunch. It's it's good alliteration to help you remember, right? (laughs) List my needs at lunch. This is all about talking to God about your needs. Give us our daily bread. Why are you eating your sandwich? Why are you snacking on your salad? It's a good reminder for those of us who sometimes work through lunch. Stop doing that. (laughs) But list your needs at lunch. Sitting there. You know, sometimes we don't ask God. We just assume that he should know and or it's too true to talk to him about. But Jesus says, you can ask for anything in my name. In James 2, 4, it says, you do not have because you do not ask God. But this is not just my needs, thinking about other people's needs. There's people you know that, you know, you maybe pray for your kids if they're at school, or you're praying for your hubby or your wife or praying for a friend or you're praying for a neighbour. There's, there's things that are going on in people's lives that we can actually just... Lift up those requests to God and thank him that his answer's on the way. Bread represents every, anything you need in life. Give us our daily bread. Do you know someone I see doing this is Pastor Janet Bryce. She prays about everything. It's great. Okay, Lord, now we just ask. We're talking about something in the halfway through the conversation. Okay, Lord, we just ask you for that and we receive it in Jesus' name. I'm like, go, girl. This is great. Mick shared last Sunday night how he was sick before he preached last week and Janet rang him up. And Janet, halfway through the conversation, Janet said, oh, can I pray for you, Mick? And he's like, oh. (laughs) And didn't have the best attitude. He shared this publicly so I can say it. (laughs) But then God pretty much lifted this sickness off him. By the next day, he was better and able to preach on Sunday night. And he's like, God bless you, Janet. Always looking for opportunity to pray. You might think, oh, it's just a cold. You can pray about a cold. It's just a lock, a lost library book. In our house, we've been praying for a lost library book because one of my child, children, who shall marry, remain nameless, cannot find it, and it's distressing them. They're worried about it. They want to find it. So we're praying about a lost library book. Lord, help us find it. Number five is ask for forgiveness in the afternoon. In Matthew 6, it says, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Psalm 32 verse 5 says, I confessed my sins to you. I stopped trying to hide my guilt and I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Do you know, by mid-afternoon... Many of us realise that there's been a few things we've said throughout the day that haven't been very helpful. (laughs) Uh, Or a few things we've thought that haven't been honouring to God. And so this is another opportunity for us in the afternoon just to say, Father, you know, people don't even have to know. Oh, excuse me, I'm just going off to confession. You don't need to do that, right? (laughs) But you can just pause in your afternoon again, stop, put your pencil down or as you're driving somewhere in between, you know, meeting someone, I don't know, just say, God, I just, I just want to talk to you about how I said that or what I thought then because I know that wasn't right. And so I just ask you for your forgiveness. I thank you that I already have it because of what you've done on the cross. And I just, I just, I want to do what you want, Lord. And so search me, or you can pray, search me, God, know my heart. Is there anything from today that you want me to bring before you that's not right? So you can ask for forgiveness in the afternoon. Number six. Oh, sorry, my example. I just talked about him. Pastor Mick, I love how honest he is about just how much he needs God and how he comes to God and runs to God when he needs, when God points something out in his life that he needs to bring before the Lord. I learned from that. I love that. Number six, ask God to help me make wise decisions. This is all about dependence. Matthew 6.13 says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. (laughs) I learned from my husband as he prays and says, God, help me be a great dad. Help me when I get home not to be flustered. Help me to focus on what matters most. Help me. Help me make wise decisions in this. And one of the cool stories that Rick Warren told 
in preaching this message at his own church was how he used to find that he was coming home every night from work feeling weighed down by all the things that he just heard people talk to him about during the day he's a pastor he's hearing people's issues people's problems how can he help them and he thought I don't want to take that into my family for the rest of the night I actually want to find a way to ask you Lord to now help me because (laughs) he started to recognize and realize that 90% of arguments happen before dinner people's blood sugar level is low I don't know where he got this stat from but I'll believe it (laughs) Because I've seen it happen in my own house. How about yours? 90% of arguments happen before dinner. Everyone's coming back. Maybe it's your flatmates. You're all coming back from your busy worlds. Everyone's hungry. (laughs) Hangry, that's right. But basically what his idea was, he got this old can and he painted it blue and he stuck it out near the front door of his house. So he could remind himself every day when he got home, he would just pause on the doorstep and go, all right, Lord, everything that I've just heard or carried or worried about, I'm just putting that in the bucket right now. When I get it, go out for work tomorrow, it's still going to be there. I just leave it with you. But I'm not taking it inside because I want to be present for my family. He did that. And it was just a physical way of him to just pause and through prayer, hand something over to God. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. God, I need your help as I go back in to minister and to be with my family. How good is that? Some of you are going to go home and get a can and paint it blue. <laughs> find, you know, find ways that you can actually, as you come back in to the people you love into their lives, that you can actually hand some stuff over or ask for God's wisdom and depend on him as you come back in. Or maybe it's at night when you're home and you're tired or when you're vulnerable. Maybe it's what you watch on TV you know, that we need us to ask God to lead us not into temptation. Maybe it's when you have your guard down that you're tempted. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, Remember that the temptation that has come into your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will keep the temptation for becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you will not give in to it. This part of the Lord's Prayer is just realising our need for God, our dependence on Him, our reliance, owning up to our need for help. Maybe if you struggle with what you watch or what you look at, meditating on some of the scriptures in the Psalms which talk about, I'll not let my eyes look upon anything vile or vulgar. You know, filling yourself up with God's Word and saying, God, help me as I go home tonight. Help me not to just cruise, open the fridge at 9 o'clock and think, Yes, what can I eat for the next three hours? You know, there's temptations that we find and face at night, sometimes when we're on our own, sometimes when we're tired, sometimes when we're vulnerable. But this is something, a posture of prayer we can pray. Lord, help me to trust you. And, yeah, I talked about who was my example for that one. The last one is end my day with an encouraging truth. Do you know how much difference this helps when you go to sleep? not thinking about everything that's wrong with the world. If you can end your day with an encouraging truth, and that's the the last phrase of the Lord's Prayer, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What an encouraging truth. As you go to sleep, you remember God is in control. (laughs) This is not the end of the story. And I've read the end of the book and God and his family win. Do you reckon you'll sleep better? Just think, thank you, God, that yours is the kingdom. You're in charge, that yours is the power, (laughs) that yours is the glory. And I can go to sleep and have rest because you are in control. (laughs) You win. This is not the end of the story. What I heard today that was horrible, God, that's not the end of the story. Why don't you try that this week? Get up with gratitude. Bless God's name at breakfast. Remember what matters most at mid-morning. List your needs at lunch. 
Ask for forgiveness in the afternoon. Admit your need for his wisdom as you come back to your house or come into your evening time. And end your day with an encouraging truth. What a difference could that make if the Lord's Prayer wasn't just a prayer we recited, but was a way we choose to live, relying on God, relating to God. That's your how. Start with one of them, start with all of them, start with them this week. Let's pray. Just be still before him. You heard a lot of thoughts and things that were shared today. Father, we thank you that you actually had it recorded down for us in Scripture that Jesus taught us how to pray. My prayer is for anyone here who's felt bored talking to you. As they just take steps, opening up their life to you in this way, as they start to practice the how, that you would meet with them in such a stunning way. I pray for those of us who maybe have known you for years, have become a bit stuck in our praying, or find it easy to just drift into forgetting about you during our day. I thank you for this little way that we can remember, this simple way that we can remember how much we need you. 